Hey guys, this is Suzanne Light. I'm coming back to you today, sitting out on my porch in a beautiful spring day. I'm liable to be sneezing right in the middle of this because the pollen, it's better, but it's still flowing. I had to wipe off this sectional real good, got rid of the Christmas pill pillows that were in some of the other teaching videos, but I wanted to come back and just pick right back up uh, with uh, our last lesson. We talked about, we were actually finishing up chapter eight of the book of John. In case this is the first time you're seeing this, I'm teaching the whole book of John and there's a playlist. So you wanna go to the playlist on my channel that says the book of John and you want to start from the very beginning because it's just giving pretty much a chronological order of the last days, the last months of Christ's life when he was active in ministry. And, um, it's so interesting. And I had asked y'all on uh, one of the last lessons what you wanted to study next. And Revelation was a big, uh, well, I had asked y'all, did you want me to try to teach Revelation? And absolutely, yes. So I'm already studying that because it's going to take a lot of studying to be able to teach that. And as I told you before, I'm not trained in it, but I'm just going to ask God to give me the wisdom and use some commentaries and gonna get it done. So uh, when we were, last lesson, we were talking about they were coming down on Jesus hot and heavy um, about who he really was and where he was from. You know, they were expecting the Messiah, but they sure didn't expect the Messiah to come like Jesus did. They thought he would come and set up this huge kingdom and be a king. And he came so humble in spirit and so different. And they just had to accept him as he was. And they were very resistant to that. And we know ultimately resistant to his death. So we're going to pick back up on chapter 9. That's where we're going to start right now. And it's the topic is Jesus heals a blind man. Chapter 9, verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground, and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen before, seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said it is. Others said no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes open? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. So the flow of the text clearly goes from where they were trying to arrest Jesus once again. But the flow of the text was not disturbed at all by what they were trying to do to him. He really had a de deadly confrontation with the Pharisees, with the religious leaders that were coming after him. So the disciples are wanting to know, what has this man done or what has this parent done that he was born blind? Well, we know that birth defects are caused by being born into a sinful world. We're, you know, it's, everything should be perfection, but sin came into the world and made it a sinful world and made it, you know, the fallen condition that it's in right now. But not due to any specific sin was this man born blind. He actually told them that this man being born blind was the plan of God. Now you can imagine their shock and even it's shocking to us when we read that, I know this from my own life, that even when bad happens, God can still work. I know that through the personal things in my life that has happened, and I know that probably 
every one of you that are a Christian can testify to that, that God can still work when bad happens. So in this instance, God would use the bad. Jesus saw it as an opportunity to glorify, exalt his father. And we know that throughout the whole scriptures, as I was praying today, before I started teaching, I said, God, this is not about me. This is to glorify you. And I referenced back, I said, Jesus all the time said, let everything I do glorify you. And I almost felt a little odd when I was praying that, that I was putting myself in the same position of Jesus. But that's exactly what we're supposed to do. I want, as Jesus constantly told him, I want to glorify you, Father. That's what I told him when I prayed today. Lord, I want this to glorify you. Nothing for me, but it all to be for you. So Jesus clearly knew that opportunities to do good and, uh, and opportunities for service to others, they weren't going to last forever. I mean, Jesus obviously knew that he wasn't going to be here forever. So Jesus had great compassion for this man, and he used this man's circumstances to work through them, just as he can take your circumstances and change everything and work through them when you pray about it. But he had compassion for this man. Now, another thing that's really interesting in this is that Jesus changed his whole formula of healing for this one particular man. Never before had we re have we read that he uh, spit into the mud and made a, uh, with his saliva and made a mixture to go on this man's eyes. So that was a whole different formula that he used. And I think, you know, it was kind of to say, hey, look, uh, I mean, obviously he could have just touched his eyes and he would have been made whole, but he chose to put something on his eyes. He covered his eyes, in other words. So as a blind man, this man had to be able to find his way to the pool of Siloam, down its steps, down the steps to the pool itself. So he, um, he could have thought, man, this is crazy. <laughs> I'm not doing this. This man's put mud on my eyes, I, you know, and how am I going to walk down to this pool? But he went anyway and washed in faithful obedience. And because Jesus told him, how many times has God told us to pray a certain way or to go to someone or to call someone that he has placed upon your heart and you're like, uh, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm not comfortable with this. Only to know that when we go through with it, that our um, obedience is what makes it come through. I've, I've talked to people before and think, why am I saying this to them? Only for them to turn and say, you have no idea how this has blessed me. You have no idea how I needed to hear this. This is exactly. So, um, and this is actually the first time in biblical history that a person born blind, that it's recorded, was healed of their blindness. So this was a huge thing. So from Genesis to John, no prophet born, priest or apostle gave sight to anyone else's eyes just hasn't happened. Jesus is the only one. Because Psalms 146, 8 says, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind, and that is Jesus is God. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. So the people were saying, this kind of looks like the guy that sits, you know, up there blind, and, and someone said, yeah, it's him, and others said, no, it's not him. It's not him. It's not even possible, but it seemed uh, too amazing to believe. Once he washed his eyes and he could see, can you imagine never have seen before to that uh, washing your eyes like Jesus tells you and being, uh, I look at all this green behind me and how vibrant the color is, and I think how beautiful and vibrant everything must have been when his eyes were open for the first time in his life. So they kept saying, no, this is not him. And he said, oh, yes, it is. This this is me. This is who y'all think it is. Um, he was, in fact, healed from congenital blindness. So the transformation in his life was so significant that many found it hard to believe that he was the same man. If you hear a buzzing over here, it's called the carpenter beads, bees. 
are buzzing into my mantle, making holes. They're ruining my beautiful mantle. We've done everything. But anyway, if you got a solution, send it. <laughs> let's, let's go on and find out what happened after this. Verse 13. Chapter 9, verse 13. They brought to the Pharisee the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. We've heard that over and over again. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. Now, Jesus could have healed this man on any day of the week. <laughs> But once again, he chose the Sabbath. The opportunity was there. I believe that God just worked it out. You know, again, uh, he was challenging the traditions of the religious leaders. And, um, you know, this had happened before. And, you know, there again, they take away the emphasis like when he had healed the crippled man. They take away the whole emphasis that the man is healed, but that he actually was healed on the Sabbath. So they take away everything that's important, but that's usually the way troublemakers are. And that's usually the way, even now as Christians, we're discredited with things. It's not what happened, it's how you did it, what spirit you did it in, who you are, what you stand for. I mean, we are being attacked and gonna be attacked more and more and more in the days to come. So the Pharisees said in verse 16, this man is not for God, from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. To the Pharisees, Jesus couldn't be from God because he did not line up with their traditions and their prejudices that they had developed through the years. So they wanted the opinion of the man who was healed and they asked him, who did this? And he told them and he said, "He said, well, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he says, he's a prophet. <laughs> he knew something miraculous had happened. Now, normally, they wouldn't even have wanted an opinion from a man like this that was very low in status. They would not. But this shows how perplexed they were because they even wanted the opinion from someone like him. It was easier for them just to believe that this man had never been blind. <laughs> that would have been so much easier for this man, you know, if, if he had just said, no, I wasn't blind. I was just sitting there and he did it. But they even went as far to ask his parents. And the parents told him he had been, you know, blind since birth. But they were so afraid of the threat of excommunication uh, from the Jewish people that they put the attention back on the man himself. And the man himself said, uh, I told you, I I've been blind my whole life. You can believe it or not. You know, and this just makes them matter and matter and more confused and everything's just not the way that they had perceived it. And they, they just, they just kept going out of their way to prove that God was not the way. And I see that happening today in 2020, uh, 2023, the media, even people, you know, they just want to disprove that there's anything godly about anything. You know, I'm so sick of hearing certain things that are just sin. And look, guys, as I've said before, and you know what? I've been losing subscribers. I've lost about 17 subscribers in the last few weeks. And one thing, people may not like these teaching lessons. It may just not be interesting to them, even though I do put other ones in there. 
But people also don't like sin to be called sin. And whatever reason, whether they're just tired of me or whether they're just wanting to change who, you know, they're subscribed to. I do that sometimes. But the enemy would say to me, uh, you're, you're teaching stuff that people don't like. People are just going to continue to drop from your channel. Well, I don't want anybody to drop from my channel. But I have an obligation to God. And I have an obligation to what this word says. It is written in here what is sin, what is not. And it is my obligation to God to teach what he says if I get down to 10 subscribers. That's just the way it is. The devil is not going to buffalo me, and he's not. And like I said, people have a right to unsubscribe. I unsubscribe from channels I don't like or that I'm just tired of watching, and that may be the case. But lots of times when you're really working hard for the Lord and something like that happens, the enemy says, yeah, you should be gaining subscribers instead of losing them. I mean, this is ridiculous. You can't afford to lose subscribe. Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> Turning a deaf ear to you, I will teach what the Word of God says. So, you know, they could disregard the truth if they wanted to, but the truth, as they'll say, and will stand when the world is on fire. And that's what's so beautiful, as I've said so many times about walking in truth, is that when you walk in truth, you don't have to have anything to back it up because it is the truth. And the truth will stand when the world's on fire. Let's go on and finish this chapter. Let's go to verse 24. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, Well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> and they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. So this guy just starts to preach here, doesn't he? Verse 32, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. So back up in verse 24, when they told the man to give God the glory, it probably was a commandment to them. In other words, you better tell the truth. You better tell who healed you and that God healed you, and it had nothing to do with this man. So that probably was a commandment. And they said he was a sinner because he did not obey their man-made traditions. Uh, this guy told him, he said, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. Is that not beautiful? Is that not the way we are when we come to Christ? As those songs said, I was blind, but now I see. Oh, the Lord just opens our eyes to the truth, and, and the truth truly does set us free. I love this man that he healed his eyes. I love this man. I felt like he was being called to preach right there. And you know what he was doing? He was just telling the truth. Absolute truth was all he was doing. So they couldn't argue against what this man was saying. Like I said, he said, I was blind, but now I see. So he kept saying, why are you asking me the same question over and over again? I've already told you. And I wrote here, basically the man started to preach against their unbelief. That was my own thought there because I thought Isaiah 115 and Psalm 66, 18 are passages that say that God is not obligated to hear the prayers of sinners. So they were using that as a fact to this man that you were born in utter sin and you are teaching us thinking that, you know, he was born in sin because there was something wrong with him. And that you're trying to teach us. So, see, these religious leaders despise the common people. Common person was what I was trying to say a while ago when I was struggling for words. And this man in particular, and this man was so well-spoken. 
after this happened. But there again, when the miracle happens directly to you, you are well-spoken because you're telling your truth. You're telling your experience. They were so angry because you know why? He was right and they were wrong. And we see this anger today in our nation. So they cast him out. The religious leaders treated this man terribly. They abused him, they insulted him, and they rejected him because they did not want to hear the truth. Let's go on and finish up this chapter with verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and he said, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. <laughs> mm, that's beautiful. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who did not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees never heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to him, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see your guilt remains. So Jesus made a specific point to find this man again and to receive him because he had just been hurt by rejection. He is doing nothing but telling these leaders the truth and they've rejected him. They've cast him out. Jesus called on him to fully believe and 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 he had to ask him who who is you know who is the son I mean do you believe in the son of man and you've seen him and he said who is it and he said you know he said it is I and he said Lord I believe oh it's so easy if we will just give up the fight and just confess to Jesus Lord I believe so they had literally put this man out of the temple but Jesus came to him and said I will receive your worship I will receive it. What Jesus was saying here, those who claim their spiritual blindness, when they, when they will find sight in Jesus, and those who falsely claim to have spiritual sight will be made blind. So he's saying the only way that you can see the truth, to know the truth, to walk in truth, is to admit your spiritual blindness and to look to Jesus for your sight because he gives you sight for everything that you need. I once was blind, but now I see. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, great, great story. And I, I'm just, I'm so impressed with this man. I just believe he, from that point on, had to be a wonderful disciple of Christ. Never being able to see and then God gives in perfect sight. I just love it. This is a beautiful story. We will pick right up with chapter 10 when we return. I hope y'all are just investing deeply in these lessons and asking God to grow you through this whole process. I know he's growing me. So until next time, I love you guys so much and appreciate you more than you'll ever know. Mwah. Bye. Normally, they would not have wanted the opinion from a man such as this um, because of him being of lowly regard, uh, a beggar, a pleader, you know, pleading. Uh, um, three, two, one. Normally, they would not have wanted the opinion for, of a man like this because he would have been considered lowly in, 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 um, <laughs> well, you just can't get it out, can you? Why don't you think about it a minute? They wouldn't have wanted the opinion from this man because he, of his status. That's what I was trying to say, because of his lowly status. So let's start over, okay?